Hello, I'm Hannah Baker, and you're listening to How's That, the Cricket Podcast. You missed the bout, I caught you up, how's that? Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of How's That, the Cricket Podcast with me, Ollie. And me, Lily. We have got a hell of a lot of cricket to talk about. We've got WNCL, we've got the Cricket World Cup that's recently just taken place in South Africa, and we've got a bumper test match over at the Basin Reserve in New Zealand. But before all of that, you know, of course, we are back for another episode of How's That, the Cricket Podcast. Make sure you follow, make sure you're all across our social channels for all the content that's going to be coming up very, very shortly. But Lily, we're going to start with the WNCL and its deja vu for South Australia. Yeah, I, I still don't really have any words, honestly, to to talk about this game. I guess in the build up to it, we can go first to the South Australia and then the Queensland Fire Games, which surprised me initially because Queensland was looking very strong. But South Australia won both of those, the first one by 94 runs and the second one by three wickets. Ella Wilson made her debut, which was really good to see for the Scorpions. She did really well at the back end with the bat and, and really well with the ball as well. Kate Peterson in that first game was incredible. She was player of the match with five for 34 off seven. And she bowled two identical balls, like one after another, one to dismiss Georgia Vole, and then the next one to dismiss Michaela Hinckley. It was incredible. Like the, it just chipped the top of off. And then we saw the first one and all that. That's an incredible ball. It happened again. The exact same ball, identical to get out two, two players. It was Kate Peterson was incredible that day. And then that obviously led them on to the final against Tasmania, which is still a bit of a touchy subject, to be completely honest. Tasmania batting first, which is the opposite of what happened last year. South Australia sent them in to bat, maybe hoping that they would get a bit of a different result from last year, but not to be because Lizelle Lee, 48, Elise Villani, 110, Nicola Carey, 2, Emma Mannix Jeeves, 11, Naomi Stallenberg, 75, Molly Strano got a duck, Sasha Maloney got three, Amy Smith with six, Sarah Coit with a duck, Macy Gibson with two. One wicket for Ella Wilson, four wickets for Anisu Mashangwe. She got four for 38. Amanda Wellington got four for 49, and Gemma Barsby got one for 62. And then it came really close, didn't it, in the end? Tasmania winning by one run. There's a bit of rain involved, but... I could not believe it came as close. Emma Dubrow with 68, Courtney Webb 83, Annie O'Neill 28, Gemma Barsby 28. Then they just lost wickets consecutively. Sarah Coit was player of the match and a very well-deserved player of the match with four for 30. All her wickets just fell one after another to get the, the tail enders of the Scorpions out and then ultimately won the game for Tasmania. But what do you make of that game, Ollie? It was pretty mental, wasn't it? It was, and obviously it's gutting for South Australia, obviously, given how they lost it last year. Obviously, last year it was a wonderful display of Tasmania batting from Emma Mannix Jeeves and Elise Villani, who we've obviously spoken to about that game. This one, slightly different in the fact that South Australia are in the box seat for quite a lot of that game, right up until the final over when they lost it. And it was four from the final over that they needed to get. And you're just thinking four with the with the quality that South Australia have, the number of wickets they had in the shed at that time, you were just thinking that they were going to get the job done and it just imploded. It was, I couldn't believe it. It was remarkable, really. Given that, obviously, they lost so many wickets in that short time, obviously, there's the package now that's come out, the one-minute, two-minute package that just shows that final over in its entirety. It's mental to think that South Australia threw that game away. Uh, I've seen a few references over the week to, to the Melbourne Stars and how we seem to to throw away games in the men's big bash. And that's up there with, with some of those games. I think it, it was just, I couldn't believe it. It's obviously gutting for South Australia. They've had two cracks at the whip now and, and missed out on them both. Congratulations, of course, to Tasmania. They were a wonderful year, the best team all year and they deserved to win it, but I don't think they would have expected to win it like that. No, definitely not. And something I wanted to bring up about the WNCL final as well, obviously with Sarah Coit being the player of the match and winning it for Tasmania. And we've spoken to her twice now and in both times she's mentioned that you know, she doesn't know how much longer she's going to be going. She doesn't even know if she should have played this season. You know, she's really not sure how how long she can ma- maintain and sustain it. And then she comes out and does that. And I, I chucked her a message because I put something on, on the How's That Story and obviously a, a congratulations message. And she she said, thank you, whatever. And then I said, um, 
seems like you could just go forever and ever. And she was like, I only stop when my body tells me to, which means that obviously her mindset around playing cricket is has changed drastically, I think. And now it's just up to when her body tells her that she can't do it anymore, which I think is really, really good to see. Um, but yeah, I thought that was interesting. We are just on that quickly before we move on. I wasn't aware that you'd sent that message. And I was just thinking, imagine if Sarah Coit, I obviously don't want to retire Sarah Coit because she's been wonderful for strikers and the Renegades and Scorps and Tasmania, whatever. But imagine if you just went out on that high. How amazing would that feel if you've just won the game against your former team, taken four wickets and just instigated the most amazing collapse? And you're just thinking, yeah, nah, I'll just, I'll just end it here. Mm. Could you imagine how, how invincible you'd feel as a player just walking out after that? Yeah. Not that I don't think, well, not that I think she will, given that you know she's got more to give, obviously. But it's just something to that I thought about, really. Mm. And and I think it's interesting as well because you see a lot of players sort of fall down at the back of, end of their career. You know, you see players struggling as they're getting a bit older, and that then they kind of realize, right now, this is my time to kind of stop. Anya Shrubsole, Catherine Brunt are kind of going through that period. Sarah Coit doesn't. That doesn't seem to be happening for her. Like she's still producing so many opportunities and and she's doing incredible so I think she's definitely in a different boat and in a different category there regarding that but yeah what an incredible player um she's so so good and so are Tasmania I think every single one of them yeah thoroughly deserve that win because like you said that they were the best throughout the year and back to back for for Tasmania but moving on to the T20 World Cup now basically we missed this entire thing pretty much because when we did our last episode, it was starting, and now it's over. So to go through the semi-final now, the, the, the second semi-final was between South Africa and England, and I think this surprised quite a few people because me personally, I was expecting another repeat of the last World Cup with England-Australia in the final, but that's not what happened. Of course, I mean, the, the last 50 over World Cup, obviously the last T20 World Cup, Australia won yeah. over here, but the last 50 over World Cup, of course, we had that final where Nat Siva was amazing for England and they couldn't quite get over the line. But if you have a look at this game, South Africa batting first, 164 for four. Laura Wolfart making a nicely put together 53. Outdone by Tasman Brits, who made a 68. And then Marazan Cap with a really nice cameo right at the end, 27 off 13. Sophie Eccleston taking three wickets. Lauren Bell, the other wicket taker with one. And then England just couldn't get the job done. It seemed like a gettable target from the start, but... They just couldn't quite get over the line. Nat Silver Brunts with 40, Danny White at 34, and Heather Knight with 31. All of those better than a ball. But yeah, they just couldn't quite get over the line. Six runs they lost by. And you're just thinking that, you know, coming into the tournament, I think we all expected an Australia-England final. Obviously, we had to think about South Africa, given that they were hosting the tournament. Obviously, you know, home ground advantage is important. And they've obviously used that well up until the final, which obviously they lost. We'll get onto that in a minute. But... Yeah, it was one of those, really, that they couldn't quite get over the line. Shabnam Ismail with, with a nice three-wicket haul. Uh, Bonga Kaka with, with four wickets. I've probably pronounced that wrong. I do apologise. If so, but four wickets for her and, you know, deserved winners, South Africa, in the end. Obviously, as an England fan, it hurts. We're going to have to wait for another couple of years to at least get a go of it at the 50-over World Cup. But at the end of the day, South Africa deserved winners. I think if you win a semi-final like that, you deserve to win it. Uh, and and they certainly did that. Yeah, I think a lot of people were also, yeah, expecting the same sort of thing, not really South Africa making it. But then ultimately, when it came to the grand final, Australia and South Africa, it, it's relatively easy to just make a prediction and a guess of who's going to win that one. Obviously, you never know, but I think... I think I've seen quite a bit around social media and, and other podcasts. I think the grade cricketer mentioned it, but thinking that the Australian women's team is the greatest the greatest of all time because they have just been incredible. They've won everything um, except for that one game against like India like not that long ago that they just lost in that series. But the grand final, I stayed up to watch it. I kept on like falling asleep. Me and my sister were there at like two in the morning trying not to fall asleep. Um, but again, it was just another... Another whitewash, really, for Australia, wasn't it? Winning by 19 runs came quite close at the end. Actually, South Africa had a little bit of a, a little bit of a boost towards the end. Laura Wolfart did really well, and it probably was quite gutting for her to to do so well and not get over the line. But Australia batted first, only made 156, which you think is actually quite 
gettable for the other team. Alyssa Healy made 18. Beth Mooney, 74, not out. And she just watched everyone sort of fall around her. Ash Gardner, 29. Grace Harris, 10. Meg Lanning, 10. Elise Perry, 7. George Wareham got none. And Talia McGraw was one not out. I think when you have Talia McGraw coming in at 7, you've got a pretty good lineup. I think for, yeah, for someone like Talia McGraw to be coming in at 7 is just a bit mind-blowing, really. And then, yes, like I said, South Africa, Laura Wolvart opening batting score in 61. Tasman Brits with 10. Marazan Cap 11. Sune Luz 2. Chloe Tryon 25. She went for it, Chloe Tryon did. She smacked some big balls. And Laura Wolvart was just standing down the other end just watching her just go crazy. Um, but then, unfortunately, was was bowled out by Jess Jonathan. And Nadine de Klerk got 8. Um, Annika Bosch was 1. Uh, got run out by Elise Perry. Megan Shoot got one wicket. Ash Gardner, Darcy Brown, Jess Jonathan all got one wicket as well. The other bowlers went wicketless. But yeah, in the end, you know, a relatively comfortable win for Australia and, and another cup and another trophy under their wing. Is it any surprise? No. 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 I think when, when, we talk, when we talk about the greatest team of all time, this Australia women's team, there's not many across the world of cricket, male or female, that even come close to it. No. Yeah. That, they just... You're looking you're looking not only in cricket, you 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 have to look in world sport, I think, for teams that are teams that are better, given how outstanding they are. I think they are. Certainly what I've seen, the greatest cricket team of all time. I don't even think from memory I've seen any other sort of sports team which would have been as successful consistently and won consecutively obviously I don't know too much about any other sports but I think it would be pretty um pretty tough to to beat what they've got going at the moment well in in the world game obviously you've got you've got teams from from lower leagues certainly in football who would who would win every year but I don't think that that measures up to something like this because it's obviously it's the everybody in the world and Australia are just consistently good in football, the only one that I can think of is Brazil back in the 50s, which, again, it just shows we're going so far back to try and compare a team. And do we really need to compare this Australia team to anybody? They just stand alone by themselves, I think. They're the greatest cricket team that I've ever seen in their field. Like, they're so outstanding. I've not seen any male team or female team, for that matter, dominate, like, dominate their sort of their field or their their peers like the Australian team do. It's unbelievable how they just manage to back up every single tournament they play in, no matter if players retire, if they've lost a game like they did against India, they're just straight back into it. It doesn't matter. They, they don't seem to have setbacks. And they have players who, even if they don't play in the 11, they've got squad members who are perfectly capable of just coming in and, and winning games for you. It's absolutely crazy. Testament to Australian women's cricket and the thing is, the bad thing for every other nation in the world is I don't see this stopping anytime soon. Yeah, me neither. Me neither. Obviously, like you know, you, you have your retirements here and there. Ra- Rachel Haynes has gone, but like you said, it, it doesn't even seem like it because of how well they're still doing. But yeah, I just think looking at it in a different light, it's obviously so good because how encouraging is this Australian women's team to young Australian cricketers seeing a team like that absolutely smash it in in everything they're involved in for young cricketers to watch and go to just have people to to look up to really and maybe people from other sports are looking up to the Australian women's cricket team just thinking like that's how they want to win and that's how they want to play to win so I think it's incredible what they're doing and I think they're obviously inspiring so many people in a a completely new generation uh, which is always really good to see but it is something. It definitely is something. Um, sometimes I have a bit of a loss for words for it because it's just so, so incredible. So to run through the team of the tournament for the recent T20 World Cup that we've obviously just been talking about, absolutely wonderful tournament. And of course, we've got Australian representatives, a couple of English representatives as well. But if we have a look at the team. We'll go one through 12. There was 12 players named. But Tasmin Brits opening the batting alongside Alyssa Healy. Both of those are fair. Uh, good performance. 
performances in the lead up to the final from Tasman Brits. She couldn't quite get the rub of the green in the final, but Alyssa Healy, you know, her inclusion was obvious. Laura Wolfart in at three. Again, a wonderful tournament for her. We saw the photo with the, the strikers players at the end of the game, which we saw her smiling after a final like that, I'm sure, which would have been tough. Nat Sivabrunt, the captain at four, Ash Gardner at five, Rika Gosh in at six, uh, Sophie Eccleston at seven. Karishma Ramarak at eight, Shabna Ismail at nine, Darcy Brown and Megan Shute, two Australian pace bowlers at 10 and 11. And the 12th player is Ola Prendergast from Ireland, which is interesting to see that we've got an Irish player in the team of the tournament. But again, that's just wonderful again for, for the world of cricket, I think, to have someone from what we would call maybe, they're not minnows anymore, Ireland, but they're not in the class of Australia or England or South Africa or India. So to have someone there is is awesome, I think. No, it definitely isn't. And she's only 20 as well. And obviously playing cricket in Ireland, not a huge cricket population. So to see her make the, the team of the tournament is really exciting, I think. We shall now move on to the England versus New Zealand test match. At the Basin Reserve, it was the most incredible test match I think I've ever watched live. I was asleep during the, the heading the Ashes test, which would be the only thing that I've been alive for that comes close. And it was really, really disappointed to be on the wrong end of it. But I wasn't even that gutted after James Anderson got out. I was just thinking, wow, what an incredible test match we've just witnessed. England, we should never have lost after forcing a follow-on. You should never lose from that position. Only I think four teams have done it now. New Zealand have just become the four to do it. England have done it twice. Uh, India did it once, maybe. I can't remember. But four teams to do it in New Zealand. And remarkable how they managed to do it. Obviously, England batting first, declaring at 435 for eight. A decision that, given the outcome, maybe looked a bit premature, given we had two wickets in hand. Obviously, when you lose by a run, you can nitpick so many points in a game and, you know, you, you never know which way it could have gone. Had we gone for another 10 runs, but shout out to Harry Brook. He was incredible on this tour. 186 he made. Joe Root just casually, you know, playing second fiddle with a tiny score of 153. Like, two Yorkshire cricketers absolutely having a day out. And we were in the driving seat at this point. New Zealand were then bowled out for 209. Not much resistance outside of a 73 from Tim Southey, which was a good knock from him when, um, right when they needed somebody. Six sixes in that as well. Fair enough to him. Stuart Broad took four. Leach and Anderson with three each in that first innings. Then New Zealand followed on. And this is where we saw the real New Zealand Kane Williamson, 132. Worth a mention as well that in that knock, he became the highest run scorer in New Zealand men's test match cricket, passing Ross Taylor. We had Tom Latham making 83, Tom Blundell making 90. And all of a sudden, this game was on. England was set 258 to win. And it got close right at the end. Ben Folks was dismissed when England needed seven runs to win. It was down to Jimmy Anderson and Jack Leach. And in the end, Neil Wagner was the hero for New Zealand. He took four wickets. He was smacked around in that first inning. So testament to him for coming back and, and taking the winning wicket, which took his team over the line. Series ends at 1-1. Incredible. Like, the worst thing, I saw something on, someone on Twitter say this too, the worst thing about that game is the fact it was a two-game series. that, that It showed how, how bad... It was, and it was a two-game series. It should have been way more. Like, that was some of the most entertaining Test match cricket I've ever seen. So, of course, now England, you know, a loss, which is really strange to say that, given how good we've been recently. But, of course, the next time that England will play a Test match, it's not quite the big one that everyone thinks. It's Ireland at first, first the 5th of June, and then it's the Ashes. So, maybe a loss just before the Ashes might be... Might be what we need, weirdly enough, just to sort of calm us down and make sure we're not getting too ahead of ourselves. But the Ashes start on the 16th of June, which, in fairness, isn't all that far away. But we shall move on now to our guest. And speaking of England and speaking of the Women's World Cup, as we recently have been the T20 World Cup, and speaking of the under 19s World Cup that happened recently, we're going to have to work our way to get a segue into there, but we'll we'll get there eventually. We have an England under 19s Women's World Cup representative from the recent tournament in South Africa. Lily, you spoke to Hannah Baker. Yeah, I did. And she was wonderful. She she obviously took me all through her her cricket in England. Uh, she plays for the Welsh Fire in the 100, as she has for season one and two. So she talked to me all about being a part of the Welsh Fire. 
the incredible players that they've had on their team and who she's learned the most from. And then she also took me almost to South Africa with her, where she she talks to me uh, all about the the under nineteen women's World Cup. She made the team of the tournament, which was incredible. So she talks to me all about that, where she was when she had a call up, and just about her entire experience in South Africa and what it was like to to go on a safari in South Africa as well, which I was very curious to hear about. But Hannah was wonderful, and that's that's coming your way right now. So enjoy the interview with Hannah Baker. Welcome and thank you very much for joining me this morning, but this evening for you. Um, <laughs> yeah, no worries. So, can you tell me a little bit about how you very first got into cricket? What is your story behind you know wh- where you are now? Um, so, I'd have to say it's all because of my brother. So, when I was younger, my brother was always playing cricket and I used to watch him, and you know, I just got bored. So, I was like, why don't I try it? So, my dad took me over to the nets while my brother was playing had a bit of a bard, a bit of a bat and yeah ever since then I've just fell in love with the game I guess but um yeah I got jealous of my brother mainly getting all the wickets getting all the trophies and I wanted some for myself so yeah <laughs> that's brilliant um obviously me growing up in Australia and I think a few people who probably listen to this are, are not from England so what would you describe your pathway as growing up in England and you know what was your junior pathway to get to to the point where you are now yeah, so it started at club level. Mm-hmm. I went through all the age groups of that, played with all the boys, and then it got put forward to like county trials. So I played at Worcester until about under 18s, and then I moved to Warwickshire, which is just a different county. But above that, again, is like academy level. So I got into that when I was like 13, 14. Mm-hmm. And then there's a senior team, which is like regional above that one. So I got into that when I was 16, I think, which is Central Sparks. And then above that, again, he's like 100. And then you have all your England pathway stuff then as well. So, yeah. So, so you've progressed through that like relatively quick then, because obviously you're still quite young and, and you've managed to progress through all those pathways, obviously, to playing for England under 19. So what's what's it been like for you progressing through each stage and you know how, how do you kind of manage all of it um, at such a young age, I guess? Yeah, it's been pretty crazy, actually, like the last few years, playing with, like, Hayley Matthews and, like, people like Anne Hartley. Yeah, it's been incredible. And you just learn so much, you learn so quick. And I guess you sort of grow up quite quickly as well. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't change any of it for the world. It's been an amazing experience for me. Yeah. Um, now, growing up, or maybe when you were a bit younger, who would you say were your, like, cricket role models, in a way? Um, I'd probably say Shane Warne because he was the leg spinner himself. Um, but then as soon as like more light like got shone onto the women's game, I'd probably say a bit of Sarah Glenn, Alex Hartley, um, Sophie Eccleston, all the sort of like spinners around England at the time. Um, and yeah, I'm lucky enough to play with quite a few, I guess. Yeah, and I guess for you now, you're in like the the prime position where women's cricket is probably at one of its peaks obviously you know with the under 19 world cup just happening and that being a brand new thing so for you to now play against and with some of the people you were looking up to what's that all like for you and you know what's it like to you to be in a position where you're playing the 100 and you're inspiring this next generation of young female cricketers yeah I guess that's the aim to just inspire as many young cricketers as I I can so I, I went into training today and one of the coaches was like, yeah, you've inspired a lot of like the young girls here at county level. And I was like, well, that's sort of the aim to inspire the next generation. And for me, just playing with like the players I've played with, that's inspired me so much to just be the best cricketer I can be and just keep improving. And like the way they go about things as well. Um, yeah, they just put 100% effort into everything. So I sort of try and take on board as much as I possibly can. Um and yeah, players like Katie George, she's always there to help me. So she's been really good as well. I played with her for like the last two years as well. But yeah, yeah, people like that really help out. Yeah. Is there is there any sort of like advice or anything that you've kind of picked up throughout your time of working with these, you know, top level kind of cricketers? And and if so, you know, what are what are some bits that you've like you've picked up and, and incorporated into your own cricket? 
Yeah, I think the main thing is for me just to enjoy it. And a lot of it's a lot of like around enjoyment because if from a lot of players, if they enjoy it, like you're gonna play better. I'd like that. And especially from like trusting yourself almost, like trust your skills you've done in training and everything. But yeah, I've learned that from other players as well. As they go about their things, they're like, you've done it in training, you can do it now. Just back yourself. That's good. And um, you mentioned before you were with the Central Sparks. Now, obviously, you signed your first professional contract with them very recently, which is um, incredible. So what's it like to be a part of the Sparks group? It's quite a, well, it's quite an impressive group, isn't it? You've got quite a few England players in there. Um, so what's it like to be in around that group? And how proud are you that you've signed your first professional contract? Yeah, it's crazy to say I'm like a cricketer and I don't have to say I've gone to uni I've got a part-time job on the side like mm. for me it's like a dream come true almost but yeah Sparks is like a family to me I've been there for a couple of years now and yeah I'm just so proud I can say I'm a cricketer. Yeah that's amazing so now going on to, to kind of like the hundred a bit now this is a, a thing that obviously me growing up in Australia and um, watching the big bash the hundred was something completely new and I had no idea what to expect so mm-hmm. For you, going into this kind of brand new tournament, what were you initially expecting and did it kind of exceed your expectations at all? And and yeah, what was the entire first season like for you? Yeah, so the first season I didn't expect to be in at all until like three days it start- before it started and there was an injury. So they were like, oh, come along. And I was like, oh, I won't play. I was like, I'm just an injury replacement. I'm like, however old I was, I was 16 at the time, 17. And I was like, that's fine. I'm just getting experience from like Hayley Matthews and people like that. And then when I was playing, it was just unreal. And I was like, it was such an amazing experience to play against players who played against playing at like the Oval and at like Edgebaston again. But yeah, you do you just learn lots of new things from people and just gaining experience was really good as well. 100 balls as well was a bit crazy, wasn't it? Yeah. But um, yeah. Yeah. It's something, something completely new. I think that everyone was kind of like, is this going to you know, work in favour of women's cricket or is it kind of going to fight against it? Now, then transitioning into the second season, in comparison, do you think the first season was better? Maybe, you know, like because no one knew what to expect or was the second season better because people knew what to expect? I feel like in the second season, the women's game probably had more crowds. So I think for me, that was probably better because you see more people there. More people want your autograph, which is also just ridiculously crazy. But um, yeah, so I'd probably say second season, purely because I think people knew what to expect. And it was just a fun day out, it seemed, for the families. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, And I guess, like I said, you know, me looking in, not really knowing much about it initially, the 100 it's obviously worked wonders for women's cricket. And I think, you know, it's, it's encouraged so many more young people to get kind of involved in the sport. So... Do you think that there's anything that other tournaments could probably learn from the 100? I think there's definitely some things that the Big Bash could pick up, but what do you think the 100 has done for women's cricket in the UK? Yeah, I think having double headers is really good because it just gives the women's game exposure. And So even if like we play before the men, like people will turn up early for the men's game anyway, so like towards the end of the women's game, there'll be lots of people and then like people after the game were like we didn't realize how good or standard like the women's cricket is so I think just making it more accessible to people is really good yeah as a team obviously playing for the Welsh Fire do you get much kind of collaboration with the men's team um and you know do do you kind of get to interact with them and, and learn off them at all yeah so we did have like a couple of conversations with the men's team they just spoke about being the best version of yourself on the pitch basically but yeah it's crazy about how I could be sat next to like Johnny Bairstow or Ollie Pope or Tom Banton and people like that mm. and it's like everyone knows who they are almost but nobody knows who I am almost but yeah it's crazy just trying to pick their brains a bit but yeah. And last season the men introduced the the draft and it's been kind of announced that that this season um it's going to it's going to happen for the women as well so what what do you make of that what's your opinion on having a, a draft for the women's hundred yeah I think it'll be good it'll put lots of names forward for the position so I think it's good to get people's names out there you mentioned obviously 
playing uh, with Hayley Matthews. Are there any other players that you've just really like taken in being around? Maybe some other internationals or, or just any of your other kind of like domestic players? Um, I'd probably say first year was Sarah Taylor because that was I was a bit like oh wow, but she's it was so she was down, so down to earth and yeah I feel like that's sort of what I've picked up on not to let anything you do get to your head and like yeah keep you grounded almost and then probably Hartley again the same this year like, I really got on with her and she was always there to help me out with fieldings field placements and everything like that to do with bowling and she's also a very good laugh so. <laughs> That was always nice in the downtime to just not focus on cricket for a bit. So yeah, she was really good. Yeah. Um, and I guess talking about like the the crowds and the atmosphere and everything, what was it like to kind of play in front of such a huge audience? Like that must have been, you know, quite a, a nerve wracking thing to to walk out in front of like packed out crowds mostly every game. Yeah, it was crazy. Like it was at Lords and I was like, I'm playing at Lords and I just remember shaking before we went onto the field. Me and Hartley were like, literally, our hands were shaking. And it was like, it's fine, it's just another game of cricket. But you look around and all you can hear is like noise almost. But I guess it's sort of taking it in as well because I feel like I probably forgot quite a lot of it because I wasn't really taking it in. But I do try to take it in a bit more now, but it is just unreal. Yeah. And obviously, like after this World Cup, I think you've put yourself in a lot of people's minds. So I think people are quite excited to see what you can do this upcoming summer. So if you're involved within the 100 again this upcoming summer, what are you looking forward to most about getting involved in the third season of it? Yeah, I think just just bowling against like other international players. And I just want to try and get as many wickets as I can almost and just show how much I can spin the ball and the control I can have but I just want to try and do my best mainly. Brilliant and then I guess moving on to the the under 19 Women's World Cup now you've played incredibly for for England but take us right back to the very beginning now when did you get your call up where were you who were the first people you told and what were your emotions? I was literally on my bed and (laughs) They rang me up and was like, oh, you've been selected into the under 19 so My parents were on holiday. My brother wasn't in the house. I don't know where he was. I forgot, probably on holiday as well. So I was like, oh, I was just sat there after the call for like five minutes being like, as if this is actually happening. I was like, this is crazy. And I rang my mom and my dad there. I'm pretty sure they cried. But um, yeah, then my brother, all the family. But yeah, they was also proud of me. And yeah, it was an amazing experience, to be honest. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And it looked incredible. Like it looked like you all had uh, such a great team and you know, you had an incredible time over there, like judging by all the, the pictures and, and everything that was posted on social media. So how was it to go somewhere completely different to another country and to just put on like an England jersey? That must have been pretty surreal. Yeah, it was like my first tour I've ever been on. So even just being in a different country and like driving around, seeing like all the different sites and everything. It was pretty cool. And then to put an England jersey, yeah, I was just immensely proud. I didn't ever thought it'd happen, but yeah. Um, yeah, thoroughly enjoyed. Did you get to do a safari at all? Yes. So we got to the safari. It was so cool. And like this, there's this giraffe which was like raised by humans and he was called Jeff. And literally he came into like our little camper van thing as we like, what is it, like a safari van, something like that. And so like, it was literally dipping its head in. I was on the end. So his head was literally right next to mine. I jumped out my seat and nearly landed on Darren, one of the coaches, on <laughs> the other side of the bus. But yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. Was it, yeah. He nice. was raised by humans. So that means it would have been like yeah. friendly. Yeah, so it was literally fine around us. And in the other like little van, they were feeding it and everything, giving it water, but I was too scared. I was like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, that's definitely something that you could only really experience in South Africa, isn't it? So that's yeah, not something you get over here. No. It'd be more like kangaroos over here, but... Pigeons um, over here. Now, you played alongside Grace Scrivens and Ellie Anderson, and you were the three players who made the team in the tournament afterwards. Now, what, what an incredible achievement that is. What was that like for you, and, and how did you find the tournament personally, and what were your kind of plans going into this World Cup? Uh, yeah, so Scrim was a great captain. She really helped with plans. Like she knows what she's talking about when it comes to cricket. Um, Ellie was also really good with her five for against Rwanda, was it? But yeah, that was a good spell that she um, did. And 
Yeah, I think my plan was coding, so it was just to just bowl the ball. And it didn't really start great, my tournament. And then as soon as I got into rhythm and I was spinning the ball more, I had more control and it felt good. And then towards the end, I guess I sort of peaked at the right time in the semis against Australia, sorry. But, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, in the final, I bowled all right, but it's very quick over the line. But yeah, yeah. How enjoyable is it to be around the England setup? Because obviously, you know, it, it's it's the perfect pathway. You've been a part of that group who have played for England under 19s. You're in the perfect kind of position to to progress on to the main England team and being in and around that big group of England players. So, what's it like to be in in that setup? Yeah, the coaching staff are amazing. You have so many coaching staff. It's ridiculous. If you needed anything, if you needed nutrition or a massage or something like that, there's always someone there. And coaching staff are very good as well. Um, yeah, I think to progress, it's going to be near enough the same sort of like standard of training every day and everything like that. But yeah. And talking about the semi final now, that was a. An interesting game for sure. Like I went to bed because it was like one in the morning and I went to bed and I was like, I was like, okay, I was like, look, okay, I think Australia might win this. I'm going to go to bed. It'll be fine. Yeah. Whatever. Woke up to the shock of my life. I was like, how on earth has this happened? I was like, I wish I stayed up because I'd stayed up right until like, yeah, the last half of the game. And I was like, okay, whatever. So fuming I didn't stay up. But um, yeah. for you being out there winning that game against Australia, what, what on earth was running through your mind after you won that so it was a bit of a I can't really remember a lot of it it's very much a blur but I just remember halfway script was like we can do this like we back ourselves our bowling attack's really good so and yeah I think after a few wickets we were like we really started to believe and I've never been more involved in the game of cricket in my entire life but I never really celebrate that much but I don't know what got into me. And as I get to Australia, I was just like, we've got to win, we've got to win. That's the only thing I was thinking. But um, yeah, it was crazy. Again, for like the last two overs after, well, I bowled when I needed eight to win. I hit a four off my first ball and I was like, oh no. I was like, I've just lost this, like, the chance of a final. But yeah, so when Scrib got that final wicket, I was literally just running around like headless chickens almost. But yeah, it was a great experience. We was all still shaking from adrenaline for a good hour afterwards but yeah it was so good I mean talking about obviously winning over Australia that's something that you have like kind of completed over the main England team because obviously they've struggled in the ashes uh, earlier last year didn't win a game and they lost in the 50 over World Cup final against Australia so what was it like to win against Australia um I guess you have the upper hand in saying that you you have beaten Australia in a World Cup yeah it is it's crazy we were like at least even if we didn't win at least we sort of about Australia almost but yeah I think the seniors were really proud as well when they came and watched the final they just couldn't stop talking about the semis still mm. but yeah we were so proud of ourselves yeah and a lot of people I saw had had family go over there did your your family went over is that correct yeah my parents went over yeah what was it like to have that kind of support um I saw like all the the flags and the excitement around the England family and friends so what was it like to have all that support there yeah it's pretty cool it was like our own little like barmy army almost I had a flag unfortunately my parents brought but yeah my dad wore his um England top but I think the standout parent was Josie's mom dancing non-stop yeah she was a real fan of England but yeah, yeah. to be honest it did give us a buzz every time we looked over there's always cheering and like yeah they were just really into it probably more into it than us almost but yeah it was funny because watching the, the the stream of it, um, it was like even you know when you probably weren't at the best position of the game, she was still dancing and she was still going for yeah. it. And like, that must have been like, because uh, as as much as it being funny, it must have actually been a bit of like a boost. Going, right, she's she's still going. We could still do this. We're still in this. Yeah, hundred percent. The energy she brings was amazing. I don't know how she kept doing it in that heat, but yeah, fair play to her. Yeah. So now going on to the final. Now this is probably not one of the you know the the, the highlights of the of the tour, um, but I think there's been a bit of time in between when it happened yeah. and now. Um, so I guess to kind of debrief and to go through it, India obviously won won the final. Now probably didn't set the score you would have liked to be able to kind of defend. So 
how was the final in a way and and even though you didn't come out on the the right kind of end of it it still must have been an incredible kind of honor to to play in a final for England yeah definitely when I look back on it I'm like we really just played in the final of a world cup and I think a lot of the girls are still sort of thinking about it and I'm like it's crazy but yeah I think even just to play against India and people like Shafani Verma and Gosh like who are international players themselves like yeah it was crazy and just having family there and looking around like there's all little kids from like local schools and everything they were really loud yeah it's probably the best crowd we had since we'd started being there yeah it's pretty amazing yeah and like you said there was lots of lots of young kids in the crowd and lots of you know, South African kids in the crowd so to play in that final and to kind of inspire like a, a different batch of kids you know not just a an England group but kids overseas in a different country have you really had time to kind of reflect on that and if so what what do you make of that yeah so like even when we was walking back to the hotel through the gates like one of the little girls came up to me and Sarah and was like Sarah can I have a t-shirt so like Sarah obviously gave her a t-shirt took a Polaroid as well but yeah it's it's amazing how much they look up to us almost and like oh we really want to play for England one day and all this but yeah it was crazy just inspiring people and just seeing how much joy they have for the game as well because we did like a cricket for good clinic I think it was called where we went um into like this field um and there's loads of like little kids like probably about 100 probably and yeah, just being involved in that, like the little chants and little games, yeah, that was amazing. Just to see how much they enjoyed cricket as well, really puts it into perspective. But yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, that's wonderful. And then you mentioned before the, the main England team came over and watched the game because the, the Women's T20 World Cup's starting very soon, a couple of days. Yeah. So what was it like to have them supporting you there? And, you know, what, what advice did they offer maybe pre-match or, or post-match? Yeah, so I spoke to Wongi before the match and she was just like, because I know her from Sparks and she was like, just embrace it, basically. Um, so I was like, I'm so nervous and she was like, it's fine. Um, but yeah, and seeing them there, it just gives you the extra boost almost. Well, for me, it did when I was bowling. I was like, let's try and do the best version I can. And like with Breezy being there, who was the fire coach last year, I was like, let's try and um, bowl the best I can. Yeah, it sort of came off, but unfortunately it wasn't. Um, yeah. What would you say was the, the biggest lesson, I guess, you took from the Under-19 World Cup? Is there anything in particular that you've you've picked up and you're going to take into your cricket in the future? I think probably the passion I played with, because I feel like I've probably played, that's probably the best I've ever played. So I think the more passionate I am, the more I enjoy my cricket, then the more performances will come, hopefully, so take that into sparks and if I get in 100 again so yeah amazing and the Australian cricket summer's over so the England one's kind of starting to kick back in now what are you most looking forward to about this upcoming summer um whether it be any tournament any anything like that what are you most looking forward to um probably regional cricket because we've got like double the amount of fixtures this year so I think just playing as many games as I can I can't wait just get out playing now we're still in winter nets at the moment so I'm literally itching to get outside again but yeah it won't be long it won't be long yeah so to go on to a couple more general things so what would be your favorite cricket memory if you kind of had to narrow it down to one um oh I'd probably have to say playing at Lords that was special so I remember like my parents always tell me a story of like when I was young I was eating like a banana in the long room and I ate a banana in the long room again, but I was playing this time and I was just like, oh, it's too funny. But yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, what what a full circle moment, but like what an incredible place to play. Now, do you have a favourite teammate at all that in any group or any team that you're a part of? I do love Eve Jones from Sparks. She's almost like my big sister. I'd go to her with anything. Um, but yeah, I do love all my teammates. Fair enough. Now to wrap up, I've got a couple of like quick fire questions. Some of them are cricket related, some of them not cricket related. Um, so we'll get going with the first one of T20 cricket or one day cricket? T20. Okay, good. 
good. Orange juice or apple juice? Oh, orange juice. I'm an orange juice girl. Good, so good. Orange squash next to me. <laughs> good. Um, Edge Baston or Sapphire Gardens? Edge Baston. Now, if you were stuck on a desert island, you could have one person with you. Who are you bringing and what two things are you taking with you? Um, Saren Smale, because she's just an absolute laugh. Um, two things I'd take with me. Oh, sun cream, because we both burn um, quite badly as well. Um, and a teddy bear. Not practical, but important, necessary Most- things. Yeah, love mm. it. Now, if you were in the last over of a game to win know, some sort of grand final, would you rather hit three sixes to win or take a hat trick to win? Sixes, because we call them Baker Bombs. So <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it'd just be so funny because I'm not really a batter. So yeah, probably three sixes. Love it. Mix it up. Everyone would kind of feel like yeah. yeah. Promote you. Bring you up the bring you up the order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, do you have a favorite TV show or movie? Oh, probably not, but it'd probably have to be Grey's Anatomy if it was. Yeah, good. Um, pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Yes. Good. What is your go-to yeah. like pizza topping? Probably just a pepperoni. I do like a ham and pineapple though, but pepperoni. Yeah, fair enough. Now, favourite cuisine? Oh, I'm really into Asian at the moment. It used to be Italian, but I'm really into Asian at the moment, so yeah. Nice. Now, if you're on a game show, um, who wants to be a millionaire or something and you had to win a million pounds, if you had to phone a friend to, to win that money, who are you calling and why? Abby Freeborn, because she's so clever and she just seems to know it all. She's got a uni degree in maths, I think. So, yeah, probably her. Nice. And is porridge a cereal? Yes or no? Oh, yes. Because it's oats. Is it oats? I don't know. Yeah, we're going to go, yeah 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 very good um that wraps up then for you now I guess going forward obviously it's you're entering your cricket you know season soon starting up soon so do you have any goals whether that be short term or kind of long term goals with your cricket um probably just trying to focus on my short term at the moment but trying to get as many wickets as I can in regional cricket and hopefully that'll set me up good for 100 as well and anything else that may come around so yeah just trying to be ruthless as much as possible brilliant love that but yeah that's that's pretty much all the questions I have for today but yeah thank you so much for joining me today it's been brilliant to have you on no worries thank you so that was Hannah Baker of the Welsh Fire and of the under 19 England team now, I don't think Hannah Baker's been retained by the Welsh Fire, but she's gone into the draft. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see where she goes, whether she'll go back to Welsh Fire, whether she'll go somewhere else. So many players have gone up into the draft. So it's going to be super exciting to see who gets picked up for the 100. But yeah, we hope you enjoyed our interview with Hannah. So like we said last episode, we're doing an episode every fortnight now. So in two weeks, we'll be back with another guest. In the meantime, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, or TikTok at How's That TCP. You can send us an email at How's That The Cricket Podcast at gmail.com, or you can leave us a rating on Spotify as well, which would be greatly appreciated. But that is all from me. See you later, everyone. How's that?